disclaimer. All views expressed on what makes us fire are solely those of the person or persons giving them. What makes us fire does not represent or claim to represent any particular city or fire department and therefore make the claim that all views and standpoints are affiliated with what makes us fire and with what makes us fire only. Any mention of certain fire departments or cities within the interviews are solely for informational and opinion-based dialogue. In short, if you have a problem with what's published, just say something about it and don't be a Richard. What is up, What Makes Us Fire family? This is Josh, your host of What Makes Us Fire podcast, founder of the What Makes Us Fire Foundation. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Today, I have a pretty cool guest of mine. He's a little bit on the veteran side within the fire service, but he is definitely with it. And you'll see what I mean. He's, he's, I wouldn't say he's quote unquote woke, but he definitely understands the fire service and how us young guns think about it. And what's really cool about it is he can bring a little bit of his, uh, how do I say his history within the fire service to the now. And that can help us as young firefighters as even, even mid age firefighters grow to be a much better individual and much better firefighter. But on top of that, he has battled with some mental health issues and he has gotten through them and he's going to share how he did that, who helped him along the way. And hopefully that his story can be something that you can use to go further in yours. So without further ado, Please help me welcome my friend Nick, better known on social media as Papa Bear. Hey, what's what up? is yeah. up, Nick? How are you? <laughs> what is this talking about? More on the veteran side? What? I mean, yeah, you're you are a little <laughs> bit you're a little bit more on the veteran side of. I, I mean, you've been in old. the you've been in the service for a while. Come on. Oh yeah, I've been in there. I've been in the service since I was a, a kid. It's uh, about thirty six years now. So yeah, 36 I, years. Yeah. So yeah, when I say a little bit on the veteran side, I mean a little right. bit on the veteran side. You've been yep. in the fire service two years shorter than I have been alive. Yep. So, yep. It's kind of funny. It's, uh, you know, I, I'm just, uh, I'm in my 19th year at the department I'm on right now. And it's like, man, it was just yesterday. I was brand new there, you know? And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's amazing how fast the time goes by. Um, it, 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 I've only been in for 15 years and it is, it feels like I can remember like my first week, <coughs> still, right? still remember my first week, still remember my, I, I don't, rem, I gotta be honest with you. I don't remember my first call. Uh, I remember the first call I went on with the first department I was with, but my first call mm-hmm. with this department, I don't remember. It, I guess right. it wasn't all that great. It was probably a stub yeah. toe or something. All right. I remember my first fire with, with this department and, um, <laughs> kind of a funny story because I was so new they didn't have gear for me yet. Really? And uh yeah, I had just I had literally had, was had joined the department like literally like four or five days prior. And um I was you know, I of course I was already a, a trained firefighter. So I get there to the station and they had a a big burner going out a rural area so we you know, got water supply issues, the whole shoot match the middle of winter. Um, it's about 20 degrees out and, uh, there, the chief is hollering for everybody that's got, you know, two legs and two hands to get out there. And, uh, so I rummaged in the storeroom and found a set of gear while it turned out the only coat that was in there that would fit me was white. Oh, so okay. you, was, you grabbed, you grabbed a chief's coat. I got grabbed it. a chief's coat. That's all I had. And, and <laughs> you know, so I'm out there and I'm helping with water supply and I've got every, everybody coming up to me calling me chief. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I, I'm just a schmuck like the rest of us, you know? Oh my and, God. Oh yeah, uh, I bet terrible. you didn't, I bet you heard some shit from doing oh, that. Oh yeah. I caught, I caught some shit from that, especially for, especially from the, some of the older guys that were there that were like the old uh, one engineer. Harold, that was on the engine. He he, give, he rode money like a rented mule on that one. Oh my <laughs> god! See, that's and that's something else. Everybody that you're gonna have to get used to. You you're gonna hear his little sayings like, a, <laughs> "Oh yeah, <laughs> rented mule," and and rode me yeah. like whatever he said. I mean, but that just comes with age, right? That just comes with age, right? Uh so man, I I really do appreciate you coming on the show. I oh, know I I asked you what like two weeks ago. We set it up yeah. and. I don't know if you've listened to any of the other shows, but the whole idea oh, yeah. is to get 
to get your history, get your backstory, and then hopefully, you know, we can go off on rabbit trails all day long because we can talk right. horror stories within the fire service. All, I can do that all day long. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, I want to kind of get into who you are and everything else. And then, of course, into your story with your mental health, because as you know, we're very mental health forward and we mm-hmm. want to help as many people as we can by sharing our stories. And you're willing to share your story. So I got to thank you right off Absolutely. the bat for doing that. I mean, that's pretty free. It's pretty awesome that you're you're willing to do that. Well, you know, it's it's kind of tough. Uh, you know, for a lot of guys, it's really tough to do. I've always been a pretty open kind of guy. Where you know, I, I've always pretty much worn my emotions on my my shirt sleeve. You know, mm-hmm. but um, it's uh, having seen the good, bad, and the ugly. Right? It's become real uh, important for me. To, you know, I lay it right out there. All the crap that I went through, all that stuff that I did, now, it may not compare to anybody else, and it's not meant to. Right. It's only meant to show that I own everything that I did. I own all the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I use that to improve me. Now, if you see that, and you hear, you know, you hear about it, and it spurs something in you, freaking awesome, man. That's that's ideal. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Um, you know, I, I've done a couple other talks, and I, I said, you know, I grew up in the service that, you know, my grandfather was a firefighter, my father was a firefighter, and it was always just suck it up, you know. And right. it was, you know, pay attention to your job. Don't worry about the other stuff. You know, do what, yep. do what's got to be done and get on down the road. And if it was that easy, we wouldn't have the What Makes Us Fire podcast. Exactly. <laughs> One hundred percent. I'm just saying, 100%. if it was that easy, suck it up, Buttercup, and then get everything got better. Yep. Uh, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have all the issues that we're having today. Exactly. So, exactly. Obviously, something's not working. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you're exactly right. Something's not working, and that um, the days of the John Wayne strong silent type aren't are over. That's all movie, you know, movie stuff. That's not reality. Right. You know, the reality is the guys that are out there that are, you know, battling with addiction, that are, are dealing with, uh, you know, unresolved traumas. And, um, you know, that's the reality of it. And it doesn't necessarily make you colorful or make you a cool character uh, because of whatever. What makes you the, um, oh, goodness, what's the, what am I looking for? What makes you the I have no best? Idea yourself is being right. able to rely on your inner strength and take those hits learn and recover from them and use them as a means of growth for yourself not to tear yourself down and not to beat on yourself but to build yourself up i agree so i agree you know <laughs> yeah, I, I, so and we'll get into that we'll get into all of that but i do i agree with you the issue that i think that most of a lot of people um would bring up when they say strength of strength within yourself only you can define it but what if they feel like they're not strong enough or i already i i that's the reason why i feel down because i don't feel that i'm strong mm-hmm. enough to make those decisions i don't right. feel that i'm strong enough to feel this certain way so we'll talk about a little bit on how we got to that point where we did feel strong enough and how right. you got to that point and then how you utilize that but before we do i kind of want to go back into your history a little bit of who sure. you were where did you come from where did you grow up um, you know, you can give me a short version, a long version, but give me a, a little papa to big papa. <laughs> well, don't don't ask for the long version from me because if you you know that I will talk your ear. No, off. I know you will talk my ear off, which is fine. I which right. is fine. It's totally cool. Just a heads up, I may like interject and ask a question or something, but I'm not trying Please to do. be. Not trying to be rude, but just think of it like no. firefighter talk. If I hear something, I'm gonna be like, hey, 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 hold on a second. What right, did you just say? Right. So. You know, inter- interesting squirrel moment here, right? Right. Isn't it? It's, it's very interesting to see. You know, you, you hear a lot of the talk about the the, um, the dinner table, the firehouse dinner table. Yeah, all the time. Okay. And Yeah, we, so, we solved the world's another, problems there. Right. And your podcast and, you know, other, other ones, that becomes a virtual uh, dinner table. It, you know what? I can see that. I can yeah, see that, that, yeah. 
So it's really cool. And, you know, you, you've got the you know, the old guy that comes in and sits down with his cup of coffee at the dinner table, right, and showers his knowledge on the younger guys. Well, so here Yeah, we well, he, he, either, he either calls all the younger guys dumb shits and right, then right. goes off as to why they're a bunch of dumb shits, or he shares right. the knowledge and everybody's just right. listening like, oh, Right, exactly, awesome. exactly. So, uh, so, yeah, so Baby Bear was uh, – Originally from a uh, suburb of Detroit, yeah, where uh, dad was a, a cop. And uh, in the in Detroit, 70s, he, in Detroit, yep. He, oh, my wow. dad went through the riots and all that kind of stuff in there, and uh, he saw the way it was going. And he came home from the work one day, and he said to my mom, "He says, honey, pack up the house. I bought a store." And he bought a little convenience store, uh, part uh, resort up in Northeast Michigan, and moved the whole family up there. And uh, he got on the local fire department and um, was an EMT and uh, firefighter for them. Ended up uh, retiring as assistant chief. And um, so he's now retired um, up there. I grew up in the middle of the woods. It was awesome. I had, um, it was a very rural area. And um, we had a uh, uh, snow, you know, winter sports. We had a lake. I was, I was the kid that basically mom would feed me breakfast and I'd come home when I was hurt or hungry. And it was, a, it was a, as it should be, as, right, it, should as be. it should be. Kids got to play with the kids got to eat dirt and get out and play and um, get away and from the scrape screens. those damn knees. Yeah. Scrape right? those knees. Exactly. So, uh, Having grown up around the, the small local department, it was my best friend. His dad was the chief, and we all grew up together. We all got on the department together. Uh, I, I think I was 14 when I was at my first call. Um, hey, before you before you go on, did you have any, like, siblings or anything like that yeah, growing up? I have an uh, older sister and a younger sister, so I was the middle kid. <laughs> oh, you were the forgotten child. Right. So yeah, the middle ones, the, the middle ones that they they deemed the forgotten. Well, I wasn't forgotten too often because I was usually in trouble for something. Oh, <laughs> no. no, Nick, no. you weren't in trouble. I was no. always in trouble you were, for something. But you're you were good. Most kid. most of it was always because of my inquisitive nature. It wasn't so much uh, being an evil kid or anything like that. It just I would get into mischief, and so that would get me into trouble. So anyways, I grew up in that department, and it was a very small department. I mean, we're talking 30 runs a year. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that is small. Yeah. That is very, small. very, very small. We had about five, I think five square miles was our main service area, and we contracted out to a couple townships and stuff for wildland stuff. Okay. Okay. Not real big. Um, so anyways, we... Uh, I grew up there, wanted to go full-time, and graduated from high school in the mid-'80s. And, of course, I wanted to go to Detroit. Well, you couldn't get on Detroit for love nor money at the time. So my father suggested that I go to college. Well, suggested might be a uh, charitable word. He insisted I go to college if I wanted a career in, in fire service, so I had something to fall back on. Right. And... It ended up, I ended up working in IT for about 12 years before my move brought me down here where I got into the, got off the old department and got into the department I'm in now. Yeah. So you, was uh, your first, was your first department a paid department or was it like a volunteer? No, it was 100% volunteer. 100% volunteer, which by the way, for everybody that doesn't know, 80 plus percent of North America's fire service is volunteer. So Correct. that means... That means more than three out of four times, if you see a fire truck, it's full of people that are doing it on their time off and dedicating their time off to serve the community. Just a heads up. Didn't know if anybody knew that. Right. So anyway, so you, you got off the volunteer department, then you head down to your area. What area are you in right now? I'm in, I'm in Southeast Michigan. I am about an hour North of Detroit. Okay. So, so, and then, and then from that point, you got onto a department in that area? Right. I got onto a department in that area. We're a paid on call department. 
Uh, okay. So I'm I'm basically paid on call, although we do run part time shifts, and uh, we do keep our station staffed twenty four seven now. And so I work anywhere from like today on Sunday. It was just a quick four hour shift, just a short just a short shift. We our mm-hmm. shifts are broken up into four hour shifts because we have one person on duty. We have two stations, um, so it just kind of works for us handling the the nuisance calls, handling the uh, first response for the medicals. We have a great ambulance company right here in town. Uh, mm-hmm. very close to us so we don't have to uh, wait a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I've been, like I said, I've been there 19 years now. We run around 1,200-ish calls a year. So it keeps us busy, but it's not overwhelming. Uh, right. I it, do... It's still not all still not all that busy. I mean, it, it's right. busy, but still, I mean, 100 calls a month between two stations. Okay, that could be, I mean, you're looking at about two calls a day on average, a call and a half a day on average. So, yeah, I mean. Yeah, the, the way our, it, the way our population is. At least you're is, doing it. Right. And the way our population is, Station 1 gets about 80, 80 to 85% of the calls. Station of course, two, Station 1. Uh, station 2 is the, out in the rural side of the township. We're almost evenly split between suburban and rural. So oh, okay. most of our population, most of our calls are on the eastern half of the township. Okay. So that keeps us busy over here. And hmm, yeah. So where else was I going with that? Uh, I don't know. I was just I was just saying <laughs> about uh, your call volume and everything else. Right. Now yours 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 is they have a paid staffing plus paper call so the, a lot of people let's let's jump into this for a little let's take a little bit of a rabbit trail over here uh, a lot of people don't understand how the fire service works when it comes to working for fire service there is like a million and one different ways that a fire service will run its its organization and a lot of it has to do with politics and who runs that certain land area? Is it an ESD? Is it a water board? Is it an actual city? Is it a rural county? Is it the state? Like there is so many different ways that a fire department can be run, right? So when you make a department that will say they'll staff one person, right, for the station, but then they will pay per call, hoping people will run from home. So it's like volunteer, but You're getting paid to run that call. That call is only going to get you like five to 10 bucks, but you get paid to run that call. Right. So there's other ways. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways that these people that, that these departments run it. And like I said, it all depends on what governing agency, like the fire department doesn't get a whole lot of say when it comes to how it is staffed and how it is ran when it comes to, uh, uh, being paid, not being paid, volunteer, not volunteer, right. and all that stuff. Right. Uh, we have a. Um, I just, I, I just brain locked on what you were saying there for a second because I had something witty and remarkable to say, and I totally lost it. <laughs> that is, that is not like you. That is not right? like you. I know. So your age is showing. True. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> You know I'm gonna give you oh, shit. You know I'm gonna give you right? shit. So I re- I did remember it though. So just you know, bear with me. Okay. I uh, my paycheck from the fire department I've said is my beer and paintball money. Okay. Okay. It's not a lot. Uh, I've been on our hiring committee for oh quite a while now, and I explained to the candidates coming in that we don't do this in our area as a career. We, we can't make a living at it. It's some extra money. It's great experience. We get, a, you know, we do get a lot of guys that come in, get a couple of years of experience, then move on to, to a full-time department, which I'm happy with. Makes the chief a little frustrated every now and then because he's paying a lot of money. It costs a lot to outfit a firefighter. Mm-hmm. So the township pays for everything. 
and they're there for a couple of years. Once they've completed their commitment, if you will, then a lot of them do move on. But it's become my job in the department to, and I took this on myself more than having it assigned to me. This is because I, you've talked to me enough, Josh, you know, I'm all about keeping those younger guys around long enough to be old guys. Right. And so if I can help them, help set them up for success, not just from a tactical perspective, not just from a professional perspective, but also from the mental perspective, that's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the role I've taken on, uh, on my own. And that's, yeah, that's where we are. So it's not a job you can make a lot of money at, even starting out in a full-time department. You know, most yeah, of those. Yeah, that is very know, true. Those, most full. You don't. Yeah, most full time departments. I mean, we're, we keep. We're going to keep doing this, Nick. Where we each got something to say at the same time. It's I already good. know it because we've already been doing it. <laughs> no, if you good. if you know if if you know a firefighter that firefighting's his only job and that's the only thing he does, he either he's either a trust fund baby or he's got a sugar mama or she's got a sugar daddy because there ain't or no way in hell. Officer. Or a command, or, or, or their, uh, no, cause even some of our command officers still <coughs> like are, I, you gotta be administrative almost mm. to be able to make it like career, career, not have to yeah, work a second job. Go. But if you, administrative. M- most firefighters have a second job or a side gig or something, or they work another fire department just to make sure that they can provide a livable, comfortable wage for their families. Right. Don't get me started on EMTs because God bless them. Oh. They get their dicks pounded into the dirt and get jack shit for it. So, Amen to know. that. Amen to that. Yeah. I have a lot of friends of mine that are EMTs and paramedics. And yeah, they're, they're definitely in it for the love of the job. Yeah, the, you have to be. You have to be. I mean, you, you have to be at the beginning. If it isn't for overtime, you're going to have a heck of a time keeping body and soul together. Yeah, because you'll start. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know? And that's why I tell, that's why I tell most people. I said, you know, these people that wear a uniform that come out to help you, they know that they're out there to help you. They're not there for the look of it. The the you know, oh, he's a firefighter. Oh, he's a cop. Ooh, ooh, ooh. no, we're not out there for that. We're out there because we love the job and we love what we're doing. We definitely don't do it for the money. So you know, right. they're there because they enjoy doing it. They and enjoy the one, and they want to do it. The ones that do come into the service for that hat and T-shirt, I call call them the hat and T-shirt guys. If the ones that come in for that, for the status or for the the cool factor, right? They don't stay around because yeah, they get because into they it. realize you're not that cool. <laughs> well, not only that, but the thing is, it's this is not Chicago Fire. Okay, no. There, there is no running around in the ladder truck to pick up chicks. No, okay? there is none of yeah, these no. cheeky hijinks, right? It is down and out, ninety-eight percent sheer bull hard work. Mm-hmm. The other two percent is the adrenaline. Which so is if why you we do can't that. handle <laughs> exactly. If you can't <laughs> handle a metric ton or as I call it, a metric ass load, because that's 10% more than a normal ass load. If you can't handle a metric ass load of hard ass work that's being done either you're dying of heat because it's 100 degrees out and you're wearing 40 pounds of gear, or you're freezing your tail off because it's 20 below and you can't keep the ice off of your face mask unless you're down inside the fire, right? If you're not up for that, you're not going to last. You're not going to last if you can't handle going days on catnaps. Where you know. so do you think the do you think the idea of of the shirt and t-shirt guys do you think they got those ideas from what Hollywood's putting out there and stuff like that or is it something else? Now I I would say a part of it is like television and the glorifying of of wearing the uniform, right? Whether it's fire, police, military, we get a lot of, you know, we all hate this term, but we get a lot of hero praise, right? You guys mm-hmm. are heroes. You guys are heroes. And I, I see, and that's not, that's not 
Hollywood. That's like the news and that's, you know, when you go out in the right. public. So that's, I think that's also a part of it too, that these people get this hero mentality that they want right. to be a hero and you don't realize that you don't feel like a hero. You don't feel right. like a hero when you do Here, the job. That's the difference. It, that's the difference. I think Josh is that those of us that do this because we love it. Mm-hmm. When somebody calls us a hero or anything like, what's your first reaction? Mine is I get embarrassed. Right? I, I say, so it used to be, it used to be, uh, I'm not a hero. I'm just doing my job. Right. right? I just say and it's my now, and leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now I learned to say, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Thank you for supporting us. Right. You know that. So I'll respond with that. So, but it I used think, to be like, no, I'm no hero. I'm just doing my job. Right. Exactly. But to us, that's what it is because our job is what fulfills us. And Mm -hmm. doing that allows our heart of service to come through because that's what we're, that's what we do. You look at any of the first responder or civil service um, categories, Mm -hmm. military, police, fire, EMS, dispatch, corrections, emergency, even emergency medicine, Mm -hmm. they're all about the heart of service. That's what draws us into it. So when you circling back a little bit, when we talk about the hat and t-shirt guys, if they're influenced from TV or whatever, possibly Mm -hmm. that's a, I would say that's probably a good chunk of it. I think one of the biggest parts of it is they want to be part of something. They don't have the sense of belonging and they're looking for external uh, external gratification or or external feel good that right. from us comes from within. Like they're looking for external validation. Validation. Thank they're you. That's looking, what I was looking for. They're looking. They're looking for that validation that right. they belong to something instead of just being okay with who they are, where they are, what they're doing. I. I, I do have a question. What brought you into the fire service? I know you said your dad was PD and your grandfather was fire, but right. like what? And I guess your dad was part of the volunteer uh, department right. as well. You did say that. So other than, other than being kind of like grandfathered in and, and having like this generational thing going within the fire service, was there anything else that brought you to it or was it just something you saw and fell in love with? Well, like, why make the decision to go into the fire service? Well, it's all of that. But the other part is, is that I was raised, like I said, in a rural area where you relied on your neighbors. Mm-hmm. You know, my buddy would come over and help me with the project and I go help him with a project back and forth or what have you. Right. Well, mm-hmm. it's just taken that as I grew up with it, it became, no- it is normal. It's part of life. It's part of what is expected of proper behavior. Is when somebody you know asks if you can give them a hand, you go give them a hand, right? So that just brings it, it brings it full circle. When I came down here, I remember my first wife. When I got out of the department down here, it just cheesed her right off because why are you taking and dropping everything and and going to help some stranger out? Because that's what you do. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. And she just couldn't grasp that concept. But that's how we were raised. Yep. It's, it's funny because my, my ex actually told me that one time. She was like, I don't understand. Like, you know, you have stuff to do here at the house and it feels like if you get a call, you just drop what you're doing to go help. And it's like, we need you here to do stuff. And I was just like, here's the thing. If I don't go and help some individual, they won't be able to be home and do the things that their wife is asking them to do. Right. Or they won't have a home because it, nobody or, or, you know, not enough people showed up to put a stop to it quick enough. Like right. I'm doing it because I would want somebody else to do this for me and my family. Right. And exactly. I want, not I want who. to be, yeah, if not us who, and I, you know, I, I give it my all because I expect whoever comes to help me and my family to give it their all as well. Like right. that's how I see it. And I, I guess expect is, is kind of a harsher word, but I, I assume that they are going to give it their all because they're doing the job again in the first place. So I'm going to give it my all. So if I, even if I'm in the middle of a project or anything else and that tone drops, I'm going. 
Right. Because I would hope and assume that other individuals that are like me are going to do the same thing to help right. me and my family. Exactly. Who knows? Maybe I'll be helping their family. Right. You know, and we have that, that drive within us is what makes it all work. Because you know, as well as I, as I do, anytime we figure out our whole job as fi firefighters or emergency responders is to figure stuff out and make something happen that hopefully has a good outcome. We're going to figure out how to get, you know, the cat out of the tree to, to use the old, the, you oh, know, God. the old stereotypical thing. I just happened to yes. see one of Jason, Jason Patton's videos about the real things I saw, I've seen as a paramedic, and it was about the cat that kept <sighs> going back up into the tree. Right. So. We always, we always tell people when we go to cabin trees, we're like, you ever seen a cat skeleton in a tree? Right. No. They'll come down when they're hungry. They'll figure it right. out. Yep, they will. You don't need to call us. You really don't <laughs> need to call us for cat that's up in a tree. Exactly. Stuck in a wall, maybe. Stuck in a chimney, right. okay, I get it. But right. in a tree, come on. Right, exactly, exactly. But so you got again, it. You, you, you did now. Did you see this? Did you see this idea of the fire service through your father and your grandfather, or was it like? something that you had an idea of and didn't really experience it until you got into it? Like what, what kind of process was that like? <clears throat> it was always there. It, it was what I grew up with. I remember mm -hmm. the excitement in my house um, back in the day. Now I'm really dating myself here on this one, Josh. We were a rural department. We didn't mm -hmm. have pagers when I was a kid. They didn't have pagers. Mm -hmm. Very few, very few radios. When there was a fire call, the sheriff's department would call the sh fire chief's house, and they would also call our store because my, we lived in the same building, and so they always knew there was usually always somebody there. My dad would head up to the station. Mom would start the phone tree, and the fire chief's wife would do the same thing. She'd, he'd head up to the station. She'd start the phone tree until they called uh, telephone, made the call on rotary phones, <laughs> made the call to all the other firefighters to get them out of bed and get them up to the station. Mm -hmm. One of us kids had to go in the back room of the store where there was a switch that was connected to an old federal queue that was mounted on a TV mast outside of the store. And so they'd hit, we'd hit the switch and the siren would go off. And then of course it was a queue. So you had to turn it back off. So it would wind down. So it would modulate. Right. And right. so I remember I was probably, six or seven years old and we had a call and I got to stand there in the back room and flip the switch on and off. Right. And made the siren wail. And That's pretty cool. That's <laughs> that pretty was, cool. That, that was awesome. I mean, and so of course then going up to the fire station with dad, uh, working on the trucks or, or just when I was a kid, just looking at the trucks and climbing on them and stuff. Uh, I was I half always, expecting you to say horse and buggy. No, 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 no. <laughs> that was that would have been my great grandfather's day because my even my grandfather when he started in Detroit Fire in uh, 1937 or 38, I'd have to look. Oh, I wow. actually have his uh, certificate in the other room. They they had all motorized stuff back then, buddy. So uh, <laughs> I know again, have, again. I'm, I'm okay. just gonna give you. Sh I'm gonna give you shit throughout. Throughout the interview, Josh, Nick, it's that's, to be expected. <laughs> if we're not giving you shit, what does it mean? We don't like you. Exactly. That's my point. Exactly. <laughs> if I don't give you shit, it means I don't like you. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the fire trucks and the fire service has been a part of my life since I was a little kid, and I went for a stretch without it, and it there was a hole. There was an empty hole in my life. Why do you think that Kidding. is, though? Why do you think that, that felt like an empty hole? Was it just because it was always there and then it wasn't there, or was it because an actual feeling of of missing something? D, all the above. It, well, it wasn't there, so of course I was missing mm -hmm. something that I used to be a part of. Mm -hmm. The I wasn't being fulfilled in the way of being able to do this, you know, have the service for people. And another significant part that played in during that gap 
is uh, there was three of us grow, that grew up together. And <sighs> bear with me. You're good. You're good. Take your time, man. So there was three of us, Larry, Rob, and I. Mm -hmm. I was the baby. Rob was two years older than me. Larry was two years older than him. And we we're all in the, on this little tiny local department together. Well, during the time that I was away from the department, uh, both of the, both of, we, I lost both of them. Uh, one to a car accident, one to a motorcycle accident. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. So I went from being the, the baby of the munch to the old guy at 27 years old. Okay. Uh, or 29. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was that that put a big hole in it, and that was something that was that really, and that was a big thing that it really had a huge effect on my mental health. And I'm, you know, it, they've been they've been gone for, for 20, 20 plus years, twenty five, twenty six years now, and it's still I'm still dealing with that. I'm still processing that. Do you think um, because you lost, do you think because you lost your friends that you deciding to stay on the fire or to go back to the fire department, to the fire service was, was kind of to honor them or to let them know, Hey, I'll, I'll keep it going. No, not so much. I think that was pretty much done entirely for me. To okay. To be honest with you. Um, I, I, I don't think I ever really explored that, uh, that thought though, to be honest with you, Josh. I really don't think really? I explored I, that thought. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause if, it, if it's, if it's you three, right. And you backed away from the fire service, these tragedies happens with your friends and then you end up going back to it as it was, was a process and, and choosing going back to it, maybe even subconsciously was to honor your friends and to be like, you know what, right. You guys, you go, you know, I'll take it from here, you know, go ahead and right. rest. Like I got it from here. You know how we, we, we say it at firefighter funerals all the time. You know, oh, yeah. go ahead and re rest easy, brother. We got it from here. Yeah, watch, yeah. Like, yeah, we, we we'll take it from here. We got the watch now. And right. so I'm I'm wondering when I hear this story if that may be a um, even subconsciously a an it, idea it, that maybe it's very possible. I mean, it's definitely worth thinking about. I'm gonna I, I tell you one thing's for sure. I'll be bringing it up next Wednesday when I have my appointment with my counselor. Because it's definitely something, <laughs> something worth, something worth, and that's that's one of the other things is I am totally unabashed about the fact that I I see my counselor every Wednesday, and I tell you what, it has been one of the best things in the world for me. Finally, after years of trying, I've stopped mm -hmm. and started counseling half a dozen times with half a dozen different counselors until I finally found one that I can vibe with. One that understands the life of a first responder, one that understands various lifestyles and very, you know, various different aspects of myself that make me up, you know, that make me up and can relate to that and that I can respect. So well, you if you tell it, tell her, you tell her from me, I'm sorry I brought it up because now you're going to have a whole <laughs> other conversation. <laughs> nah, it's all, it's all good. No, but no, it, it, I really, I really think it's an idea maybe you should explore that you know you, you felt this emptiness in this hole not only because you weren't doing it anymore but now because you had these two other individuals that you did this with right. and and being a firefighter creates a brotherhood creates a bond that is like no other so if, if they're no longer there you want to continue that it's almost like a way to to keep them in touch with you right you know what i mean right oh yeah yeah oh. i could like i say that's why that's why it's really got my gears spinning thinking about that because it's uh you know, you're, you're exactly right. And, uh, I've never really dug into that side of it that, that deep. So. Oh, you know, well, believe it or not, you're not, the, you're not the first person that's told me that, you know what? I haven't thought about that. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm like, right. Uh, I didn't, I didn't mean to bring up anything bad. It's just ideas, no, you know, perspective, right? No. What do we talk up? What do we talk about all the time? Perspective, right? Changing one's perspective exactly. to help fully help them grow. So, um, yep. so you, you, you get back into the fire service. How, sh how soon after uh, the loss of your friends did you get back into the fire service? Oh, it was, uh, 
it was years. It was it was several years. I'm just I'm trying to think. It was I went to join the local I used to live in another city about 30 miles west of of here. And I went to get on that local department and I had a really really bad experience with the uh uh the chief. And uh basically I introduced myself on a small local department and I introduced myself and I said, Hey, I'm interested in joining up. And I basically got a response of send us your resume. And he turned and walked away. And it oh, was, really? a, yeah, it was, and it was a small rural, again, volunteer department. And I'm like, at that point, I'm like, well, you know, hang, hang that. I'm not bothering with that. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, we ended up here where I'm at now. And it's literally within a month of moving here and getting settled. I stopped in the department and said, I want to join up. And the chief said, when can you start? <laughs> and that was it. Nice. So nice. Yeah, it was so, all about the attitude. So you, you can, you, can you, <laughs> Other than feeling like something was missing, was there anything else that would have brought you back to the fire service? Because it sounds oh, like, you know, I just felt like I was missing something, so I, I tried to go back. <laughs> yeah, that was, it, no, it, that was, that was, I mean, that's only a part of it or, or a potential part of it. Right. The fire trucks, working on the fire trucks, working the, the working on fire scenes, doing that stuff has always been just something that was within me. I okay. was doing it as a kid. It was, you know, it was there. Working on the trucks, driving the trucks, operating the trucks, all that stuff. I, I'm a truck operator at heart. Always have been since I was a kid. And, you know, I've spent the last six or eight years basically doing only truck operations and water supply and, and training. I... I'm now here at that point now where I need this. I moved up a slot, so now I'm getting more into the, um, more back, back out of the, of the left seat. I'm over in the right seat now. So now I have a whole, whole different set of challenges and, and opportunities ahead of me that I'm looking for for the rest of my career here. So. But basically, you moved up to a, a officer position, right? Yeah, basically, right? Yep. Yeah. So I, I was that, promoted that, in here after the first that, year. That's that's an interesting that's an interesting topic that we talk about. Now we read it in our training books and everything else about how when we move up. Excuse me. Ooh, that that beer that beer got me right. Yeah. Got me a little bit. Uh, we hear about like how, what changes are going to be expected and everything else, but you never, you never read anything in the books about what kind of mental strain, um, uh, that'll right. put on you, right? Well, the, like these new, these new roles and responsibilities that you are now assigned to and said that you are going to do, how are, how are they going to affect me? Well, you don't know until you do it, right? Everybody, anybody can tell you, Oh, well, this happened to me. This happened to me. This happened to me. Well, everybody has exactly. their own different experience because I might be able to handle some stuff you can't and vice versa. You can handle stuff I can't. So when we get into those officer positions, there's a little bit of a, a stress, I think that goes with it. Oh yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Did, did you go through any of that? Uh, not so much yet. I've only been in the, the position of a couple months now. So mm -hmm. I haven't really been tested yet. Part of me is anxious, anxiously awaiting it. Another part of me is terrified shitless. And, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, Ter terrified shitless. <laughs> well, I mean, I, th I think, I think. Going into an officer's position, just knowing now you are the guy. The the buck stops with you on the fire scene. If something happens, the buck stops with you because you're the incident commander. You're the guy that makes the decision. So if somebody gets hurt, if somebody does something wrong or whatever, you're and shit rolls downhill, buddy, and yep. you're gonna be the first one to get shit on. So like that, just knowing that already would put a little bit of anxiety on on me. Like, uh, shit, I better not fuck this up. 
Exactly. Right. Exactly. So. Yep. And that's exactly where that's exactly where that feeling is. You know, part of it oh, is the excitement right. so you're, saying, you're, "Hey, you're, listen." You're... The part of it saying, "Hey, I get to, you know, I get to run this the way I want to run it." Right. I get to do it. Right. I so you're excited. Done. But then you realize the flip side of that is that, oh, shit, if anything goes sideways, it's my fault, you know? Yeah. So. It's all your fault, Nick. All your fault. <laughs> That's right. That's okay. I got all of the fault. There's a broad ass. I can handle it. <laughs> uh, you do have a broad ass. I've seen it. <laughs> you weren't on accident. To talk about it was on accident. <laughs> It was on accident. It was on there was, accident. There was a lot of we involved, see things right? in the firehouse. <laughs> we we see things in the firehouse that that we we just are not prepared for to deal with in life. Okay, it happens. <laughs> exactly. It exactly. just happens. They they say the calls. They say some of the calls you can't deal with. <laughs> yeah, right. you see some of the guys that you work with do stuff that you're like, oh, I exactly. did not need to see that. I could have gone the rest of my life and been so much happier had right. I not seen that. So I'm just saying it was an accident that I saw your ass. Okay. And I didn't mean to make you almost shook. <laughs> so, okay. So you're, in, you're, you're in an officer position now and you, you say you haven't been tested really. What, what would, what would being tested look like for you? Like, what does that look like? Cause I mean, you're point, already in the position. Right. At this point, it's going to be running, a, a running my first major incident. Okay. You know, a, a multi alarm structure fire. Um, e- heck, even even a single alarm structure fire out in the rural part of our district. Right. Because that can be a pain in the <laughs> ass trying to figure out water supply. That alone right. is, is fucking anxiety right there. Right. Right. Exactly. And so, you know, we have, we have a, a, a decent amount of water capacity uh, for transport. For a smaller fire, if we have a bigger fire, then we're going to be calling in mutual aid and and striking a second or third alarm, and mm-hmm. then it's going to be then it gets even more complicated because now you're talking extra ops channels and you know water supply and all that kind of good stuff. So, so for you to be truly tested, it would have to be some type of major incident for you to feel like you, okay, now I'm being tested in the position. Right. Yeah major or complicated or just make it sure that I keep all the balls in the air. How about being tested as looked at as a leader by your guys? Does that cross your mind? I think, I think my guys have looked at me as a leader for quite a while anyways. Okay. Because I've been, what we call it in our department, we call it senior man. Basically Mm -hmm. like most rank structure goes, you go from the officers down to this, the, the firefighters, once you had seen firefighters, it all goes by seniority. So right. I was, for the last several years, I've been the senior man. And so that, I think, has helped. I've also got, I've been FTO for most of the guys on the department. So I've been a, an FTO for them. So they've see, already seen me in a leadership role as far as teaching them, um, setting up trainings, that kind of thing. So I think what the hardest adjustment is going to be is remembering that they're not they're I hate to I hate to what's it remembering my place in the rank structure has moved has changed. Right, I'm you can't you can't be guys, everybody's not, buddy all the time. I'm not one of the guys anymore. Well, and so you, you know, can't forget it, where you came from though either. Exactly, a hundred percent. And I, I will still, and I pray it never changes. I will still be the best advocate possible for every single one of my guys. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. But by the same token, there's times when I would have joined in on hijinks that I can't or shouldn't now. Right. I you like know, how you put not- that in there. That I can't or shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Shouldn't being the operative Shouldn't. word. Right. You know, it's like, you know, do I really stand there with everybody else now and laugh as we have, uh, you know, the rookie stirring the, the tank water, um, you know, that kind of thing. Right. 
yeah, it's fun. Yes, but I really yes, need you to, should. Yes, I you really should stand to, there and laugh. <laughs> I need to find something to do in the other direction as rapidly as possible. <laughs> yeah, tell them to go find the hose loader. Tell them to go find right? the hose loader. The silver and then, plated uh, tell them, uh, hose stretcher. Yeah, silver plated hose stretcher. Tell them, tell them to uh, to run start the K twelve. We yeah, <laughs> that we one. Can't, we're not allowed to do that one anymore. <laughs> there was uh, well, there was a whole whole incident about that one that was quite it ended up being um it ended up being quite amusing but it could have it could have gone sideways for us but uh yeah so we don't we're well, not that, allowed to do that but. no matter what you do in the fire service it can go sideways so right. if a little prank goes sideways i mean it's i mean come on the one come the one on. that the one that i had a big problem with is that we had at one point this was many years ago that there was a prank where somebody filled a bunch of people's boots with pond blue. Yeah. Okay. You See, that's, know. you do not mess with gear. That's one of my things. Exactly. One of that my was, big things is was you don't thing, mess with gear. Somebody messing with gear. And that was, that was a significant issue. There was, that was a, that was a no bueno in my book. Yeah. But, I, uh, I, I, I'm like, Hey, if they left, if they left their laundry in the dryer and they haven't picked it up, yeah, I'm going to put it in a bucket of water and put it in the freezer and they're going to have a big ice block of clothes, but their bunker gear, like the actual bunker gear. Yeah. No, off limits. PPE does not get messed with. Yeah. PPE does not get mixed with. No. Off fucking limits. And that's for everybody out there. Anybody in any service, whether it be military, police, fire, EMS, do not fuck with PPE. That is exactly. life saving stuff. You do not fuck right. with it. It should not be part of any prank. Right. Now there's anyway. nothing saying you can't hang a great big sign on their stall that says, you know, so and so did this, right? Or you can right. do something that but don't ever mess with their PPE. No, don't. Never. And we're not saying PP for everybody else out there right. listening. We're saying <laughs> P P E, personal protective equipment. P P E, not P P. And we wouldn't want to mess with their PP either. So you know what I mean? Right. No. <laughs> well, let me rephrase. Most of us wouldn't want to be messing with their PP yeah. either. I don't. PP I either. have no desire to. I don't. So I, don't leave yeah. it at that. I have no desire to <laughs> as well. But like I said, I can't say all. Not most. Right. I, 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 I feel confident good. in saying most people don't want Everybody to mess with Everybody has their own, their own choices and, and uh, uh, proclivities. That's the word I was looking for. How do you that like that is for a dollar word? That's a big word. That's a big word. <laughs> right? Proclivities. Dude. Right. <laughs> All right. So now you're a fire officer. Well, let's get back on track. God, Lee. See, I love when we go off on little rabbit trails like right? this because it makes it, so it makes the show so much more fun. People are listening to it, laughing their asses off, especially other firefighters and shit that know exactly what we're talking about. Right. Uh, and, and, <laughs> uh, so you're an officer now and you've been in for your current department, 19 years. I'm assuming you have well over 20 plus years within the fire. You said 30 something, 36 yeah. years in the fire service, right? So uh, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, man, uh, what's it looking like when it comes to retirement? Like how, how close are you to that? Cause I know a lot of guys that I, I, we had a Lieutenant that was 67 years old when you retired, we had a fire chief that was 80 something ended up having a heart attack. I mean, we, it was the running joke in the department. He's going to die in his chair. Cause he was at, he was at right. administration. It was a running joke because like he could have retired 20 years ago and he, he actually could have made more money retired right. than continued working, but he continued working. So like, what's, what does it look like for you? Um, I laugh and say that I'm going to work half a shift on my funeral. Realistically, I'll probably, probably five to six more five to six more years yeah probably probably that's where i'm going to be i'd like to i'd like i i re, i'd like to reach captain before i retire uh my mm-hmm. grandfather was a captain so it's kind of like that would be cool um is it necessary <laughs> that'd be that'd be cool <laughs> <laughs> but, but the nonchalantness about it well that'd be know, cool it would be, <laughs> but um yeah, uh, realistically, probably five, six years. Five or six years. Then, so that would put you right. at that would 42 put me right around six years. years. Yep. Yeah, but that would put you at 42 years in the fire service. Right. 
Jesus, dude. That's a long <laughs> yeah. freaking time. It is. That's a I've long seen time. a lot of change. I've seen a lot of change. And you know, and, and this is this is no no kidding. When I first started when as a kid, it was long coats and tall boots. That's you why know? I thought that's why I thought you were gonna say horse and buggy. <laughs> right. We had <laughs> you know, our, our long coats weren't rubber like my grandfather's were. They were Nomex, but they were still three quarter right. length coats and the tall boots. Yeah. With the red ball yeah, gloves, you over- you're you're probably not even old enough to remember what red ball gloves are. But some anybody that's I, old, I know, listen. I know what red ball gloves are. Come All right on now, yep. I mean, I never used gloves. them because they're right. ancient. But no, I know yep. what they are. So okay, so you you, you want to put another five to six years in? What are your plans within the five to six years, other than captain? Maybe, eh. yeah. but other than <laughs> other than right. mm, that'd be cool to get captain. Other right. than that, like, what are you trying? What what are you? What's your purpose in wanting to go another five to six years? Because it, I I honestly think you could ask anybody out. Hey, if somebody puts thirty six years into a career, do you think that's long enough for them to retire? And I I would I would venture to say now this is a complete guess, but I would venture to say more often than not, I would say within probably the ninety percentile, we'll say yeah, absolutely, fucking retire. Mm-hmm. So, like, you're staying in for another reason other than just maybe getting captain, which would kind of yeah. be cool. So, like, what what kind of change are you trying to do, or what are you trying to accomplish with that? I'm my main goal is teaching the the young firefighters to be old firefighters. Okay, keeping us alive, not just through training and tactics, but also in getting our mental health cared for, mm-hmm. um, getting people to understand what's going on in our brains and how we can how we can care and feed for them better, um, or feed and care for them, however you want to put it, It how we can help keep our brains, how we can keep our brains straight. I also, I train and I teach at the fire Academy. Um, I'm a state fire inspector, or excuse me, not inspector, state fire instructor. I -hmm. don't want to be an inspector way too much. books. Yeah. No, No. do not want to be way too much. Right. Way too much. I studied years ago for my, uh, national electric code stuff and holy smokes no nope. no nope. that's instant nope. you open that book and instantly i'm out good night yeah well you probably had to read brannigan's like 50 times over so <laughs> yeah and you're <laughs> laughing because you know exactly what i'm talking about <laughs> yep oh my god for those of you who don't so, know brannigan is like the king in uh building construction and mm-hmm. collapse and what light wing wood frame trusses are the devil Mama says, yes. they're the devil. That's basically what he says. You see they're good doing lightweight two-by-fours now? Yep. Out of OSB? Yep. Yep, which is the that's most... That's another one that's going to kill guys. Oh, yeah. Not, well, I remember. It, the thing is, that's it's not better to build it faster and cheaper. That's going to kill... That's going to kill civilians. That's going to kill occupants. Yeah, because it's going to burn too fast for them to get out. Way too exactly. fast. Way too Way fast. Way too fast. Anyway, we are getting into terminology that I'm sure some of the audience does not understand, which is fine. I love this kind of talk. We can talk like this all the time, all day, every day, because I like picking somebody's brain about it. But so you're you're wanting to basically be an influence on the younger guys. You want to teach them how to become an old hat, right? And right. for everyone listening out there, for all the young hats, you listen to become an old hat by listening to the old hats. They, they were able to, it wasn't all just luck. They know what they're doing. Right. Some of them. We stand on most, the shoulders most of the giants. Them. Exactly. And a lot of what they learned was paid for in literal blood, sweat, and tears. So yes. you, you got to listen to them. You got to heed their warnings. Now saying that, There's been a lot of development within the fire service, within like we were just talking about building construction, a lot of changes in what we actually deal with Mm -hmm. that even some of the old hats are starting to feel left behind with this new stuff that's coming up, right? They're learning as we are learning, right? Right. So these old hats are learning just as much as we're learning because of all this new stuff that's coming about. But you are you delved into something that's a little bit new in the mentality within the fire service. Right. And that is our mental health. And 
I want to jump into this conversation with you now. Uh, we went a little bit through your past, through your history. We dicked around a little <laughs> bit and, and, and laughed right. at each other. But I, I want to get into like the nuts and bolts of it now, right? You're you're an old hat that wants their guys and girls to understand that their mental health is worth preserving, is worth taking care of. Not That's a cool. lot of old, not a lot of old hats take on that mentality you know it's still the mentality like yep. we said at the beginning of the show it's still that mentality it's like suck it up buttercup uh if you can't stand the heat stay out of the fucking storm you know yep. like there's just all these things right you there's got no the, crying in baseball there's no crying in baseball you play <laughs> ball like a girl <laughs> that that is a line from the Sandlot. I am. I do not mean to be rude or mean to anybody. I'm just saying it's a line in the Sandlot, yep. and it's a freaking damn good movie. And it was. It is one, one of my favorites. It is a burn. It is a yes. burn to baseball players back in the '60s when that yep. was supposed to be made. Anyway, right. Uh, so, you, what what got you to this idea that uh, this me- the, the mental health thing should be something that you want to focus on for the next five six years? Well. It's kind of a convoluted road, but like life, that's what we have, right? Oh, no. If life was peachy and in order, nobody would have any problems ever. Exactly. So (laughs) the convoluted road that brought me to it was basically two failed marriages. um, Realizing as I'm getting ready to have my shoulder rebuilt, Mm-hmm. that I can't do what I did last time because I've had both of my shoulders rebuilt. The first one was done around 10 years ago. And, of course, if you've ever seen anybody or had anybody had rotator cuff surgery and had your shoulder rebuilt, you're in an immobilizer for 10 weeks. There's nothing you can do, basically, and except let it heal. When I had that done about 10 years ago, I sat there in front of the TV with the remote control and was absolutely miserable. I ended up going into a th- another another black depression, I call it. Basically, that's where I just got into that hole and kind of pulled it closed over top of me, and I went out for a while. Mm-hmm. So this time when I was going in here about two years ago to get my shoulder done, I realized I had to do something different. I couldn't do the same thing. I knew I was in for this period of immobility, but I couldn't do this. I couldn't react the same way. I had to find something better. And as luck would have it, I found TikTok. So flipping through TikTok gave me something to do. And as I was flipping through TikTok, I found a group that was supporting the mental health of first responders. Mm Mm-hmm. And I kind of got involved with them. And next thing you know, in within that group, I was leading the first responder division. And we had roughly 50 to 60 people just in the first responder division that were actively reaching out and talking to people and talking to people that were having a rough time. And there was a lot. I was amazed at how many people and how much time was needed to help get these people some some help and and even just to talk and and help take some of the take some of the load off or give them a, a like we said earlier some perspective or just let them vent. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm going to stop you real quick because sure. you went through you went through you getting soldier surgery and everything else and then you found TikTok and then you found this group which was championing helping uh civil service members with their mental health. The, th- the thing is is that you haven't really mentioned any type of mental health issues that you were dealing with. So what possessed you to even think about joining them or or, or having an association with them was it because you might have been going through something yourself and you can relate oh, or yeah. was it just or was it just my, ah, i figure i can help my history has always been it has been <laughs> it's been kind of like i said convoluted i went through mm-hmm. a period um 
about 23 years ago. And this, again, was in that period when I was sort of in between departments. Mm-hmm. And at one point, I I sat there with the pistol in my hand in my truck. And what, I said, got, I got to give it give it one more minute, you know. Yeah, but, what what got what got you to that point? I want to I want to I'm sorry I'm I'm stopping and breaking no. it down, but I want to break it down. The reason why I want to break it down just so you can understand is that I want people to understand kind of your point of view on what got you there because I, yeah. I I'm I'm venturing to believe that you're probably not alone in that feeling and for people to oh, understand yeah. what what got you to that point sure uh, might help others to understand and, and and relate right so at that time I was going through job issues uh, mm-hmm. I had gotten laid off from my job uh my wife and I were at odds. Of course, we had financial issues up the cojones. Uh, I had two young kids I was worried about. Uh, my ex-wife's mother-in-law or mother was living with us because she had her marriage had fallen apart, and it was all rest. It was all resting on my shoulders. Okay, and mm-hmm. I was ground down. I spent a year basically laying on the couch totally disconnected from everything i had no emotions other than anger i had no joy my 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 two-year-old son didn't bring me joy i mean yeah, that's that, it, it's insane that's just, yeah, it's a, right. It's insane. Right. And yeah, and so that was all that stuff. That and this is one of the reasons, Josh, or that when you talked about earlier about the the subconscious or the the hole in the um, in my life from the fire service. Mm-hmm. That you know now the like I said we, we I talked about it and I never really got that deep in analyzing it and. I'm sure that there was a big chunk of that in that that ball, that ball of dark that was inside of me at that time, mm-hmm. you know. And um, so this 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 ball of dark would would expand and contract over the years, right? At that point in my life, it was really big and it was really overwhelming. But what happened was is it shrunk for a while. That things were okay. So I was like, cool. I ain't got nothing to worry about. I'm just doing my thing. And then mm-hmm. I got big again. And then I got small again. And I realized at some point, you got to start dealing with this shit. And get it, get through it. And, and take all the chunks off of that ball of crap that you can and get rid of them. Right? Mm-hmm. And how you do that is difficult. Through TikTok. I mean, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. it is difficult. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. trying to throw and some little bit of light no, in the situation, it, but yes, no, you know, you're right. You, you, it is difficult, gonna, extremely difficult. Everybody, everybody finds their own particular mix of things that right. work, right? Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, there are things that we use and overuse to that end up hiding it and not actually dealing with it. Alcohol, drugs, risky behaviors violence, whatever, okay? There's any number of things that we can use. Overwork, working yourself to the bone and not taking any time off, right? Not taking time for you or to do other things outside of work. There's a lot of different ways that we tend to hide that stuff. (coughs) Excuse me. And um, so, again, when I got into this space and I knew I wanted to do something different and not get into that hole again, and I happened mm-hmm. to find the TikTok and getting involved with that led me. How, Go ahead. How did you find TikTok? And then, and then we'll get into how it led you to where you were going to go. But how did you find TikTok? Because here you, you, you're an elderly gentleman, right? You're, you, you, you got some years <laughs> on me. You got some years on me. And when you think, when you think TikTok, Excuse me while I get my walker and my bed of music, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. 
But you don't think uh, that somebody your age is going to be on a, a social media app like TikTok, right? Because it's yeah. it's it's something that was uh, advertised, and when I say advertised, and I didn't really do every advertised. It's all been word of mouth, but still, it was more advertised as something for the young ones, right? So right. how and like what was it that kind of steered you to that social media app? I've been I've always been pretty tech savvy. Okay. Okay. Um, again, coming from an IT background, uh, I've I've always been pretty tech tech savvy, and the interface and the you know the way the TikTok works just was easy to use. And um, okay. with my ADHD brain, being able to flip through all the different media after you know you get your little dopamine spike and then you swipe up to the next dopamine swipe air spike, you know. So mm -hmm. being able to do that really was that what was a big help in that regard but the biggest okay. help was actually the people that i found on tiktok okay is that Some what them, is that what you are going to tiktok led you to finding these people yes yep they led me okay. to finding these people. sorry i interrupted oh no you're good trust me that's what it's all about man this <laughs> whole thing is about us exchanging and interrupting so finding these people brought me to realize that, A, I wasn't alone, okay? I wasn't mm -hmm. the only one that was going through this crap. There, it wasn't that what was wrong with me and what's wrong in my head, okay? I wasn't the only one. There's others out there. There's others who have already successfully negotiated these minefields that I'm going through. So being able to see that would give me a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of ideas on what what I could do. And that there was a path forward, that there wasn't all just dark. All right. It's what okay, so I I guess how do I go from this? So you get on the TikTok and because you're tech savvy and you kind of keep up with the times, which is cool, right? Not everybody does. Some old hats mm -hmm. like to be like, well, we didn't need that shit back in my day, so I don't need it right now. And we get those guys all the time. So, but oh, yeah. you, you found this, this app, the social media app, and you're not the first person I've had on the show that has said that this social media app has kind of been a saving grace for their mental health, right? And more often than not, it's not just because of what they're seeing, but because of the people that it gets you in contact with. Now they, they right. you know, TikTok has its issues, but man, there is something to be said about its algorithm. There is something to be fucking said about its algorithm because right. it gets you in touch with like-minded <laughs> people, with people that are trying to better each other, better themselves, and then help others. That's how I met you. And th that's true. That's true. We met via social media yeah. on TikTok of all things. So, it, and I'm not knocking it. I'm not doing it. Right. Don't get it twisted. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying it's right. interesting to hear because there's this there's this phenomenon that's happening with people that are using social media for an outlet. Now it blew up the last three years because we went through that damn pandemic and right. a bunch of people had nothing better to do other than to scroll through TikTok, make content, do something to keep their minds busy and their hands busy. So, you know, this thing took off with, I, I, what I believe is an unintended, unintended audience in that it's now for middle age to upper age people to really, really connect in a way that I don't think we've ever connected before, especially when it comes to the mental health part of it. Right. right. So for people that don't understand social media and that are still kind of like, well, what is this social media shit? It's like TikTok has this, they call it mill talk for military. They call it mental health talk for mental health people that are into mental health. They call it uh Viking talk. They call it, I, I mean, there's all these little genres right. and you'll Jeep hear, you'll hear the genre. Yeah, you'll hear the genre, then talk, because you like certain videos, and then TikTok uses its algorithm and shows you certain videos that are going to keep that dopamine, that keep you swiping and everything. But the unintended consequences of that was it actually allowed you to uh, inter interact with the people that were making that content. So they weren't just a video on a screen. They were actual people. Now that you right. can converse with, you can talk to, and you can literally build a relationship with, which has almost never happened before. 
It's, it, it's almost never happened before. And so now you're meeting these people that have similar ideas as you or have an idea that is challenging your thinking enough for you to interact. And it creates a friendship out of that challenging of thinking. I think mental health talk is probably the biggest of the challenging of thinking aspects of it because so many people give so many different points of views, so many different stories, so many ideas of how to get through that, that it's actually become very helpful. Right. When I got onto TikTok, I actually asked my therapist because I got onto TikTok. Somebody told me to get on TikTok to promote the podcast. I was like, I, I was going to just promote the podcast. That's all I was going to do. But then I went through my mental health crisis. I started scrolling through mental health talk unintentionally. But, and, and I started seeing these videos that are like, wow, I'm not alone. I'm not alone in this feeling. Right. I'm alone in what I went through, but I'm not alone in this feeling, right? I'm, I'm not alone in this yep. feeling. I, I can understand that. And people, you know, started saying, Hey, we got you. Hey, you need to talk. Hey, this and that. And it was just, it just, it, it, it blew my mind. So I asked the therapist, Hey, would it, would you think it's a good idea for me to share my story on social media? And you know what she said? She said, Absolutely. Because the more you talk about it, the more you share your story, not only could you help somebody else, but you are actually helping yourself and not allowing that thing that's bothering you so much to control you. <laughs> and you're controlling it. You're controlling exactly. it. Exactly. So exactly. It was like, it was like this big bing, light bulb right. and go on, right. go through it. So you get on TikTok, you meet these people. Where do you go from there? Like how, how else, how did, the, how did meeting these people on social media and, and going through this mental health area for first responders help you out specifically? Oh, goodness. A, a, a lot of different ways. First of all, again, like we said, I'm not the only one going through this. Okay. Or something like it also gave me. For one of the things that worked for me was being able to talk to others and give them this different perspective or just be that listening ear, help fulfill that part of me that, that care, that caregiver side of me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, you're listening to people talk and tell you what's going on in their life. And of course, our brain being what it is, where it wants to draw connections and draw, see patterns, right? It allowed me to see the patterns that were similar in my life and in my brain to what this other person was expressing. To me. Okay. Then through that, it led to where I physically went and, and traveled across the country and met up with some of these people. And I got to hug Kelly's neck. I got to see some of these people that have been influential in helping me. Um, and it's hitting me hard right now because I see where I've come from where I was a year ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so getting, getting to actually see some of these people in person and be in their presence was amazing. And then of course, then that success built on another success. I know that. That, you know, uh, certain people tell me, you know, hey, well, I talked to my counselor and they said this. And the other one says, you know what? I couldn't find another counselor or couldn't find, you know, I hated my other counselor. We didn't work. We found another one. And then it's like, the you know, the light bulb goes in my own head and says, maybe I need to just put a little more work and find enough, uh, into finding a counselor that works with me, that works for me. So then that kind of gave me the kick in the ass I needed to not only get off my butt and find one but to say it's okay to do that it's okay to counselor shop it's okay to, mm -hmm. to to find to try out okay to try out a uh therapist or a counselor okay it's okay to give you know to, to give them a, a, a probationary period you know and in doing that i went through <laughs> right i went absolutely yeah, yeah i'm like shaking my head yes <laughs> yep i went through like three or four more and then whammo i found one that i i uh, vibed with and we you know now it's like so now I have this other tool in the toolbox right what it's kind of funny because my uh, stepdaughter her dad is a also he's a uh, he's also a counselor and uh, just just not mine but anyways and he and I, he and I are, <laughs> that that'd be a little awkward right but he and I get along good 
And when I first started doing this stuff with the TikTok and working with uh, um, the group online and stuff and started speaking, I was I was getting ready to go out to Oklahoma to speak to an EMS agency out there. And I was talking to my stepdaughter's dad. And as a therapist, I said, you know, what, what kind of tips can you give me? And he said, well, he says, number one thing to remember is this. When you talk to somebody about counseling and they say, what do you know? What do I need counseling for? I'm not crazy. And he said, my favorite reply to them is this: What are you going to wait until you are? And you know, of course, I had to laugh, and you know, and and we were joking. But the 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 key point that he told me is this: He said, think about it, Nick. He says, you're a firefighter. The township or your 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 agency, whatever, gives you this big truck filled full to the brim of tools. For you to use, put out fire, to do ex- vehicle extrications, whatever, to do all this stuff. They give you all these tools. But do they give you a single tool to take care of your brain? They give you g- a gym to use. Do they give you something to use to, to fix your brain or to keep your brain healthy? You know, you think about it. Mm-hmm. He says, going to a therapist, a therapist or counselor is not going to solve your problems. They're going to give you tools that you can use yourself to fix your problems. Okay? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and of course the light bulb goes on in my brain and says, you know, that's pretty deep actually. And so being able to get that kick in the ass from mm-hmm. the other people in the group that I got associated with is what, like I said, led me to start trying out and, and other counselors and finding out finding one that works with works for me and works with me and then showed me some of the tools that I needed to use and along with those tools comes what hard work you've got to put in the work you've got to sit there and say damn it today was tough but you know what I'm going to try to do that much better tomorrow. And doing that, putting in that work, putting in that stuff, that's what got me to this the place that I am now. And I and I can mm-hmm. honestly say I think I'm in the best mental health position that I've been in ever. Which it's taken a lot of makes, work, a lot of pain, but it's got me there. It, it makes me so happy to fucking hear when somebody feels that way, right? Oh. I, I, I don't. Like I, it really does. It, it really makes me feel like hell yeah, right? Like it can be done. It's not impossible. Exactly. It's a success. It's a success story, and the more success stories that can be shared and heard or seen, yep, it doesn't make it feel so insurmountable that you can't exactly. do it yourself. And one of the biggest things that I had that helped me along this journey was I got to know, um, and I. I got to know this woman I call Miss W. Mm-hmm. And she's a single mom out in Oklahoma who's an absolute doll. And she had, you know, I look at my screwed up self and, and, and stuff, and I look at it and say, I got it easy compared to that. But I have watched this person put in, again, a metric ass ton worth of work on herself. Mm-hmm. And getting herself, her trauma dealt with, getting her toxic situations and, and her own self straightened out and she's done an amazing job of it. And I look at that and I say, damn, that's inspirational to me. That got me moving and helped, you know, again, give me the impetus, impetus, give me the kick in the ass I needed to help. There you go. (laughs) Start doing things, start doing things for myself for the right way that it's okay to put me first. When it right. comes to that kind of thing, it's it's OK and it's expected that you should put yourself first when it comes to that, because, you know, coming from the first responder world, what's on? And we had this conversation the other day. What's the first? Right, thing I'm the one that do? brought it up. I'm the one right. that brought it up. <laughs> what is the first thing you do when you go roll up to a scene? Scene safety, yeah, you, right? Scene safety. You got to make. T- so we're always taught the three, the three keep in line, keep yourself safe, your partner safe, and then the patient or 
whatever's around you, right? right? And the reason why, because if something happens to you, you become a liability, you take away from the patient, you put your partner in danger, and it just becomes exactly. a whole shit show. So you got to take care of yourself first. And it's the exactly. same thing with your mental health, with the same thing yep. with your life in general. You got to be okay with you first. You got to love yourself first yep. before you can love anybody else as much and really truly yep. give them a hundred percent of that love. Because if you don't love yourself, you're only giving them 80%, 50%, whatever the case may be, exactly. you're not giving them a hundred percent you because you're not right. good with yourself. And the same is, is the same thing within the fire service. You got to be a hundred percent ready to go for you because God forbid the shit hits the fan. People right. are going to be relying on you and depending on you. And you have to be willing to give a hundred percent of yourself when that happens. Right. Yep. So absolutely. absolutely. I, I got, I, I have a question for you. Why, why take this to the fire service though? Like why, why in your point of view, why take it to the fire service? Why use your story and, and your passion for mental health? Uh, for your, your crew and for your guys and girls that are coming in for the young hats, so to speak. Um, a couple of reasons. First of all, it's an area that I'm really familiar with. Okay. We, mm -hmm. like we said earlier, we have our brotherhood. Okay. We have our family structure. So it's easy to help those within the family because you already have, <laughs> My <bad>. you already, <laughs> you, but you already have a relationship. Uh, you already have a little bit of common ground to start on, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> I, you know, I've buried enough firefighters. Okay. I don't want to do it anymore. I want, if I'm going to bury a firefighter, you know, when I want to bury a firefighter, when they were balls deep at 83 years old, okay, with a smile on their face that it took the mortician three days to get off. That's what I want. That's how I want to bury every firefighter from here on out, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to bury a firefighter or an, a medic or a cop or a military veteran or an active duty military or anybody, you know, a, a, a dispatcher, corrections officer. I don't want to bury one that sucked on the barrel of a gun. You know, we don't need that shit. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. And by God, the kids coming up don't deserve it. They deserve to be able to have the fullness of their life, the fullness of the joy that comes with our job, the fullness of experiencing the pain that comes with our job and processing through it and putting it in its place as an experience that we learn from, that we grow from, but doesn't control us. That's a good way to put it. An experience that we learn from, grow from, but doesn't control us. Right. And it's very, it's, it's off, more often than not that we find our, our demons in our head and the things that we battle with our depression, they control kind of like our lives and what we do and how we yep. think, even though we don't want to think that way, we still do it. Why? Because, mm -hmm. well, because, it's never going to get any better anyway, so I might as well, right? It's that whole mentality. The mentality is just stuck, and you have to fight through it. And that's where that work yep. comes in, using the CBTs and going to therapy and talking to friends, listening to this podcast, right. listening to other podcasts, reading a book about it, finding out about what's going on within your head. I, I cannot tell you how eye-opening it is when you can actually – understand what's going on within your head because for me as a civil service member as a medic right for me as soon as i was able to put it in physiological form i.e what's happening in my brain like this is an actual right. chemical thing that's going on in my brain it's not just this all of a sudden came out of the air emotions as soon as i could right. understand it that way for me it was an eye opener it was yeah. ah this is something i can fix this is something i can tangibly fix because it's physiological and i <laughs> If it's physiological, there's things I can do, stuff that I can take, therapies that I can do that can ch change this. Can I can heal myself from this. Exactly. <clears throat> the key term being heal myself from this. <clears throat> Excuse right. me. I can get as much help as I want, but unless I'm willing to put in the work, all that mm -hmm. help's going to be for naught. Exactly. It's going to be for naught. Exactly. So, exactly. 
So you you really really have a <clears throat> God at least something's on the back of my throat. <clears throat> you really have a passion. Whoa, whoa! <clears throat> it is something small, so that could be it, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> no, um, you really do have a passion for this, and you can hear it when you talk about it, and you can right. see it when the emotion comes through when you say the words and stuff. And, and right, I re- I respect that about you that you're not afraid to show those emotions, you're not afraid to put forth that. Hey, look, this is it. This is what it looks like for me. And you're not afraid right. to show it, yep. you know? And yeah, it, I think that's very, it's beneficial for more right. than just yourself. I figured out that pushing it inward and yeah. trying to control it, right? <laughs> that's what she, <laughs> Sorry. That's what she said. <laughs> uh, I, uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're killing me! Sorry, Paul. sorry, sorry, sorry. We're having to have this deep conversation. And everything else, there I go but, with that. But you know what? No, that's cool though because that that's that's it's good having the rapport. And I mean, it. This is part of it is being able to be comfortable, right, in having mm-hmm. a very deep, meaningful conversation. But being able to understand that when the humor comes up, which it's going to, because that's one of the ways we react to stress, right? Absolutely. But understanding that when it comes up, it's not – I didn't take that as you picking on me, right? We shared right. a moment of, of humor, and it's a bond thing, right? So it actually – it even though we're in the middle of a serious conversation, right, and we just start laughing about something stupid, right, that's mm. a good thing. That is showing – a good relationship or good, good health, good. Progress. I think it's showing that it, the serious of the seriousness of the conversation is not controlling the conversation. Right. Right. Just like the bad things. Cause it is, it's a, it's a pretty serious topic, but it's not yeah. controlling us and how we react to it. We're exactly. not allowing it to control us and how we react to it. We're, exactly. we are controlling the conversation about it, which means we have a, we have a better handle on it than right. some do or don't. And right. I, and I think that's a very beneficial thing. And it's actually very healthy, by the way, for everybody that thinks I'm being a dick. It's an actual very healthy thing right. to be able to not allow certain things to control you. Right. Right. Yep. And that's, you know, that's part of that plays with it. It's, it's kind of funny too, because, um, <laughs> one of my very first talks, I walked up and I had my backpack and I reached into the backpack and I grabbed a handful of those little individual packs of, um, uh, Kleenex. Mm-hmm. And I started throwing them out on the table to everybody. I says, okay, folks, shit's going to get real. So I brought these for y'all. And then I threw them on the table, and then I pulled out a giant economy size box of Kleenex. And I says, and this one's for me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and so everybody kind of tittered, right? But then uh. as, as the conversations went on, and as we started swapping some stories and talking about things, you know, the interesting thing I noticed is, yeah, I had mine, and I, I did pull my, my tissues out a couple times and dry my eyes like I do. But I noticed there was a couple other people that did too. Mm-hmm. And that means you're hitting. That means people are starting to bring stuff out. And it was a great conversation and it was um, a great start. Sometimes that's all it takes. And it does, sometimes a start doesn't even have to be great. It just needs to be a start. You know, get a start. I think that's the hardest part of the journey of, 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 helping yourself is starting having the conversation, having the conversation with yourself and admitting to yourself, I need help. Something's not right. I need help. And then going to somebody that's close to you, like a family, Hey, something's not right. I'm I'm starting to look for help. And then you go and you talk to some professional and that's like the, for me, the hardest conversation I had was with myself, admitting to myself how I was living my life, how I thought I should live it is not actually how I should live it for the life I truly wanted. Right. And that's part of it, too, is is how many times have we told ourselves, I need to do this. I need to get this. I need to do, you know, I need to get my mental health straight or I need to get 
a new car. I need to get right. the. I need to write the. I need no, no, to no. write the lieutenant's exam. Right? right. Hang on a second. What do you actually need to do? I need to eat, sleep, sleep, breathe. breathe. Okay. But I want to get my mental health straight. I want to write the lieutenant's exam. I want to get a new truck. Okay. Right. Understanding you definitely the correct have to understand definition. The difference. Mm-hmm. Right. And putting those putting those in your brain. Because not only does it give you the difference, but think about it. And this is this was I read this somewhere and it just the light bulb went off in my brain. When you redefine it in your brain and you say, I want to get my mental health up straight, or I want to to write the lieutenant's exam. Okay. When or if you have a setback in that in your work towards that goal, what happens? It's not a negative. It's just is. It's just a setback. Okay. I still want it. I'm still going to get there. Right. But if you say mm-hmm. you need to do it, you have a setback. What happens? It becomes you feel negative. defeated. Right. You feel right. defeated. It becomes negative. So <clears throat> if you could simply change that word in your thinking, rewire your brain or b- better yet, build a new reflex. To build say, a new I yeah, want, reflex vocabulary. Yeah. Right. Bill, I want this. I want to do this. If you build mm-hmm. that reflex in your brain and you recognize it, again, it's going to take practice, just like building a new reflex. If you're learning a, a, a new golf swing or whatever, it's going to take practice. It's going to take work. You're going to be successful sometimes. You're going to fail sometimes, but you want to do it. So you're going to keep practicing and it's going to get better and better and it's going to be easier and easier and it's going to become instinctive. When it becomes instinctive, that's when you have success. Remember what we absolutely. Said. How many times your training officer said to you, "Don't train until you get it right. Train until you, you can't, can't get, it wrong. get it wrong." Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's the exact same thing with learning new ways of thinking, learning that new perspective in your brain. Practice it until you can't get it wrong, and that's you know almost almost until it becomes coming. muscle memory. Exactly. It has to become muscle memory. It, it has to become. It muscle does. Memory. Beca- it does become muscle memory. You know, I'm right. I'm living proof of that, because when I was younger, I had a temper about that long, that or a fuse about that long, and I would come on. Mm-hmm. Now it takes a hell of a lot more, because I've built the reaction in my brain when I feel it coming on. The very first thing I think of is okay, I recognize I'm getting upset. Why? Nine times out of ten, I'm getting upset because I don't have all the data. I don't. There's some, a point I'm missing, or there's some factor in this conversation I'm missing, right? Mm-hmm. So I say, okay, check myself. This is what what am I missing? And I'll investigate to find out what I'm missing. And like I said, nine times out of ten, I find a crucial piece of information that I'm missing from this conversation or from this idea or, or this whatever the the conflict is about, right? And then once I have that piece of information. It all filters through the brain, and my brain is, works very logical a lot of times. So it just all of a sudden, bang, 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 falls through all those filters. Like, oh, okay, cool. There's no reason to be upset. Now I understand. And that's a pr- learned, pr- uh, pr- uh, learned skill. That's it's a, a learned, learned practice. It's a learned practice. Right. Yeah. And so you have to, um, you have to do that. You know, and that's. Part of those, again, those tools that you learn through therapy, through t- conversations with others, um, through getting the information passed down from us old hats to the young hats. Right. You know? Right. So, <laughs> so what's next for you then, right? You are, you found yourself, you, you found yourself doing a lot better now. You right. are sharing your story in hopes to help other people. You, become kind of an officer and your hopes is to become a captain all with the idea of helping the young hats become old hats. Like a lot of your story shows me that you went through a lot of these struggles and you're going through a lot of these struggles all to help others. What, what's next for you in next say five, five years or so? Like, what are you trying to do now? Uh, as far for in the, the fire service or, you know, in the, the professional side of me, I'm working on expanding my teaching. 
uh, as a state instructor. So, go, you know, learning more classes that I can teach. Um, mm-hmm. <coughs> excuse me, working on that. Uh, there are some sort of mental health certifications that I am gonna that I want to start w- working on getting. I I am a ma- old school maverick. Basically, all of my education comes from the streets, as far as you know, on the mental health side of it. I have the only mental health or type classes I ever had was the critical incident stress debriefing classes at the you know at the county and mm. your psychology classes in college. Everything else has been learned on the fly, right? So I do, I want to get some of the certifications and some of the uh, trainings that'll help me be more effective in my mental health ad- advocacy uh, mm-hmm. in my working with people. I want to do more of that. From my personal side, well, I want to I want to do a bunch of work around my house. I got a I want to build a pole barn here in the next uh, I should say a barn dominium because that's really what I want it to be. Uh, <laughs> in my yard. In, I have a nice piece of property so I want to put a barn dominium out back because I'm hoping that here in the next six months to a year my stepson and his wife are moving back into back to michigan and i'm hoping that they're going to move here and take move here with their their my granddaughter and any future kids here and then i'll be able to live out in the my barn dominium and so i'll be able to see my grandkids out there you know a lot and that kind of thing so um those are some of the you know main goals over the next few years for me that's awesome. So, it sounds it yeah. sounds to me, Nick, it sounds a lot like you're getting close to retirement thinking. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm definitely getting getting, <laughs> getting close to retirement thinking. Now whether or not I'm actually gonna gonna do it. I I'm always one of those people that I like to do nineteen things at once. Okay. Yeah. I, I play paintball, mm-hmm. I you know, like to travel, I like to hang out with my friends and I'm always you doing play- something. I don't sit still well. You play paintball? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I love to play paintball. I've been playing paintball for what twenty five years now. Holy crap! Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm, one what, the, I'm one of the old, old guys. That's what all those bruises on your ass that I accidentally saw came from. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Oh man. Well, brother, oh, yeah. like. I, I really do appreciate you sharing your story and your my pleasure your passion your passion through with all of this and your true want to help others and your true Absolutely. want to even better your true want to help yourself and to further right. yourself and your understanding with your mental health and becoming <coughs> better and everything else like that I, I think you sharing your story with that and showing the fortitude and the want is is beyond instrumental in helping somebody else trying to find that want to go and and get the help that they're wanting they just don't know how right. or they don't know when or, or they just haven't found that courage to actually start the conversation yet and hopefully when listening to this like they, they can hear that hey if an old hat can do it why can't i right Heck he's yeah. not saying suck it up buttercup he's not saying you That's know right. if you can't do it don't do the job or anything like that he's he's saying look i did it and I'm doing it. I'm still in the process. I'm not yep. perfect, but I'm getting there. And that's exactly right. That that means something to a lot of people. And I think it would be so. very encouraging to others. I, I, I really think it would. I really I think it will. I think when people listen to other people's stories, they realize they're not alone in the fight that they feel like they're going through alone in. Right. You know, it, it's it's you this idea lonely, that but you're not alone. Correct. Yes, correct. You might be lonely, but you're not alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And nobody fights alone within this realm of what we do in the civil That's service right. realm, especially. And for all of you that are not in the civil service realm, trust me, you do not fight alone. There's plenty of us. Look, we're in the career field that we're in because we actually like to help. And exactly. if there's somebody out there that needs help, we're all for it. That's why we do our social media thing. That's why we do this podcast. That's why we, we're developing all this other stuff. So, uh, I, I truly, truly, truly believe that you, Nick, are, are doing something inspirational and motivational and actually productive in your goal in helping those that are dealing with mental health issues. I really well, do. Thanks, buddy. So, 
uh, continue doing that and, and continue making your TikTok videos, continue going live. Uh, for everybody uh, that's listening, if you want to follow uh, Nick on social media, you can follow him Papa underscore bear underscore 1.0, Papa bear 1.0 with an underscore between Papa bear and bear and 1.0. Right. And you can follow him on social media on TikTok. Uh, is there anywhere else <laughs> that they can follow you? Uh, I'm mainly on TikTok right now. So that's the best place to follow me right now. Yeah, go follow him, hit him up, watch some of his content. You might be able to catch us on live one night. And when it's after dark, I tell you what, you're probably going to get some pretty damn good laughs and or be like, (laughs) ew, ew. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Ew. So, uh, brother, much love to you, man. Thank you so much. Um, you too. Are you, I, would you, would you think about working with, uh, I know you already do, but you working with nonprofits or even starting your own or doing something like that? Oh yeah. I'm, um, right now I've been kind of just lone wolfing it. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I'm not opposed to working with any, I, I definitely would prefer to. It's just a matter right now of finding the right fit, and uh, I'm not, I'm not so much in a hurry to find one as I am just to let the right one show up. It's, it, it's kind of, it's kind of well, a weird, well, weird gonna... way to look at it. But no, no, no. It, it's just, it sounds perfectly great because hopefully I'm the right one, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit after this right. interview and see if maybe we can good. get you to uh, help us out a little bit, and maybe it'll be something that you're. Uh, that you might be passionate about. So, but anyway, Matt, again, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for coming on to the show. My pleasure. Everybody go follow Nick, Papa underscore bear underscore 1.0 on TikTok. Remember everybody that life in itself is not so insurmountable that you cannot overcome it because life is your life. It's not everybody else's life. It's not the rest of the world's problems. It's your problems and you can beat them. Scott, and all you've got to work like all, Nick's sake. All you've got to do is just do that much better tomorrow than you did today, right? That's yeah. It. Use and uses Nick's penis size as a measuring tool, <laughs> right? Yeah, too far. Move your fingers closer together. Oh, closer okay. Together. Closer, close. There you go. Now you're getting close. Okay. That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That's bigger than me. Hey, oh. I've hung like a bull mouse. <laughs> 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 Wait, don't they have like penises that are half the size of them? I don't know. I'm just, I never looked. <laughs> <laughs> my my eyes aren't what they used to be, buddy. I'm old, remember? Oh, that's right. Gotta, that's right. That's I got to take half of Viagra every morning just so I don't pee on my shoes. Oh my! Wait, what? <laughs> what did you just? What? What did you just say? I said, that that. <laughs> You got to take a Viagra morning just so you don't pee on your shoes? Right. I got to take half a Viagra every morning so I don't pee on my shoes. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, on that note, everybody, much love. <laughs> Stay safe. All right. Have a Bye. Great See you.